So dear friends, we go to the last segment or the last unit of my presentation. And I have titled the fourth segment as issues in higher education. What are the issues that we grapple with in higher education? Whether we are teaching in a college or a university, what are the major issues that we grapple with? I would like to talk about very briefly. I have listed 12 issues. Now, there are more issues, but for shortage of time, I have cut short my list to 12 major issues. Now look at the first two points, whether it is a college or a university, all college teachers and all university teachers are grappling with autonomy and freedom. Okay, so do we have autonomy? Do we have freedom? Whether we are teaching in a college or a university, maybe if you are teaching in a university, you have more autonomy, you have more freedom. Maybe if you are teaching in a college, you have less autonomy and less freedom. Now, if you are teaching in an affiliated college and if you are teaching in an autonomous college, the amount of freedom or the percentage of freedom and autonomy that you have, that also differs. But let us ask this question from a larger perspective. How much of autonomy and how much of freedom is given to colleges and universities? So that is a debatable issue. And in fact, in my opinion, this is a major issue in higher education. Are we really autonomous when it comes to framing the curriculum, when it comes to including a particular text, when it comes to excluding a particular text from the curriculum, okay? When it comes to teaching and evaluation, do we have the autonomy? Do we have the freedom of, or does the university control colleges? Particularly if you're an affiliated college or a constituent college, does the university dictate terms? Now, these are major questions that we have to ask, and this is related to the second point. Now, since education, particularly higher education, is the concurrent place, it is the prerogative of both the state government and the central government. So, if you are teaching in a state college, if you are, if you are teaching in a state university, you come under the state government as well as the central government. So, therefore, <coughs> One major issue that teachers, college teachers and university, university teachers grapple with is the issue of autonomy, the issue of freedom. And this becomes all the more glaring because higher education is in the concurrent list. It is the prerogative of both the state government as well as the central government. So therefore we are caught between the state government and the central government and this is a major issue. Now the next major issue is liberal education versus vocational education. Now for the last few years there has been a lot of talk on vocational education. The government of India has started BVO courses, Bachelor of Vocational courses. In fact it has also started MVO courses, Master of Vocational courses and earlier it had community colleges, now these community colleges have been merged under these Deen Dayal Upatiaya institutes. Okay, so the question is, who should offer liberal education and who should offer vocational education? A further question that we have to debate is, is it the job of a university to offer vocational education? Because earlier we discussed and we made it very clear that universities are supposed to take up research, particularly research of a higher order. Now, should we focus on research or should we focus on vocational education in training? Okay, so these are some of the important questions that disturb the teaching fraternity, liberal versus vocational education, and who should offer vocational education? Earlier, vocational education was offered by polytechnical institutions. But today, even universities are offering vocational education. So how do universities balance between research on the one hand and vocational education on the other? So this is a major issue that is debated in the corridors of colleges and universities, particularly universities, and I want you to think about it. Now the next major issue is STEM versus STEAM. 
Now, if you go to the United States of America, very often you hear about STEM. So STEM is an abbreviation or an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Okay, so higher education. So what is the focus of higher education? It is sciences, particularly physics, chemistry, mathematics, and life sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Okay, maybe you feel comfortable with STEM, but I don't feel comfortable with STEM. Why? Because I would like to ask you, if you focus on sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what about languages? What about humanities? So therefore, there is STEAM. What is STEAM? S stands for sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, life sciences. T stands for technology. E stands for engineering. And A stands for arts, languages, humanities, your psychology, your sociology, your literature. Then M stands for mathematics. In other words, the major debate is what is the future of humanities? Okay, I can reframe the question in a different way, maybe in a grim manner. What is the fate of humanities? Okay, what about history departments? What about language departments? What about literature departments? What about economics departments? What about sociology departments? What is their future? Will these departments, will these subjects, will these disciplines be consumed by pure sciences? Now, this is a debate, and this is a major debate, and we should pay attention because, unfortunately, the world thinks, and a lot of people think, particularly those in universities, that the sciences are superior and the humanities are inferior. Okay, so therefore, the question is. Can we afford to neglect the humanities? Can we afford to marginalize the art stream? So therefore the debate is between STEM versus STEAM. And the key issue here is the future of humanities. <clears throat> so the next major issue in higher education is what kind of research should colleges and universities undertake? Is it pure research? Pure research is also known as theoretical research or applied research. Now, so what happens is many universities is, if you want to prove, you look at the PhD thesis submitted to colleges and universities in India. What is the nature? What is the character of these PhD dissertations submitted to colleges and universities, particularly universities? Okay in terms of science, science dissertations, okay? Most of them are the embodiment of pure research, okay? So there is a conflict between theoretical research on the one hand and applied research on the other. Of course, people may argue without theory, there can be no application-oriented research. So all applied research, it carries on the fruits of pure research or theoretical research. Now the debate is, how long should we undertake pure research? Okay, so when should we shift to or change over to applied research? So we have a lot of issues. We have social issues, we have economic issues, we have medical issues. We are in the midst of COVID-19. We are talking of a pandemic. So in this context, what we need is applied research, research that will come up with some solution, some vaccine. So pure versus applied research, this is a major debate in higher education. The next major issue is compartmentalization, whereas interdisciplinarity. I have already talked about interdisciplinarity as one of the major issues in higher education as one of the key graduate attributes. A good student should be able to think beyond his or her subject. I may be a literature student, but I should be able to think beyond literature. I should be able to think like a student of psychology. I should be able to think like a student of sociology. 
I should be able to think like a student of economics. In other words, I shouldn't constrict myself or confine myself to my own subject or my own discipline. I should have the vision and the capability to think beyond my discipline. So today we talk of interdisciplinarity. And in fact, very interestingly, particularly in sciences, they say only at a lower level, we compartmentalize science into physics, chemistry, botany, zoology, life sciences, but they say at a higher level, they all merge. It is no more compartmentalized. So compartmentalization versus inter and multidisciplinarity, that is another major issue in higher education. Then of course, we have commercialization of higher education, okay? Now, what, what do we mean by commercialization of higher education? And whom do we point our fingers at? Okay, primarily we are talking of two key players. One is state private universities. Not that they do not offer good education. They do offer good education, but commercial. Then we also have private deemed to be universities. They also, some of them offer good education, but once again, it is all commercialized, okay? So commercialization of higher education, particularly with reference to state private universities and deemed to be universities, private deemed to be universities. So this is another major issue in higher education. Now we go to the next major issue in higher education. Now we are in the midst of a pandemic, COVID-19. All colleges and universities are closed and schools are so closed, but then education continues. Education goes on, but then through a different platform, through a different mode that is the online mode. So today the debate is, which is better, the online mode of education or the conventional, the traditional face-to-face -face mode of education? There are people who support online education and there are people who support the traditional, the conventional face-to-face -face education. Now, I don't want to go into the merits and the demerits of the online mode or the conventional face-to-face -face mode. What I would like to tell you is there are advantages and disadvantages in both the modes. Online mode is better in certain respects and the face-to-face -face conventional or the traditional mode is better in certain respects. So therefore there's a debate which is better and which is more pragmatic and which is more useful. But then ultimately we need to evolve a hybrid model. What is this hybrid model? So once schools and colleges reopen, let us say in August or September, whenever MHRD decides, we go back to our colleges and universities, but then that would be the new normal. It would not be the normal, that would be the new normal where we will have the hybrid model. So what is this hybrid model? We will go back to the conventional or the traditional face-to-face -face model, but then we will not confine ourselves or restrict ourselves to the conventional face-to-face -face model. We will supplement it with the online mode of teaching. So we will have to go in for the hybrid model. So the next major issue in higher education is accreditation. And very often when we talk of accreditation and ranking, particularly at the international level, the question that people ask is this, whether it is Times ranking or QS rankings or the Shanghai rankings, why is it that no Indian college or university figures in the top 100 bracket. In other words, why is it that in India we do not have a world-class university? We talk of Harvard, we talk of Columbia, we talk of Yale. We say these are the best institutions in the world or some of the best institutions in the world. The Ivy League universities, now the question is, why is it we do not have in India a world-class college or a world-class university? What is it that we lack? Okay, now three things we lack. In other words, 
if any indian college or indian university has to find a place in the top 100 bracket or the top 200 bracket they should improve upon three things what are the three things number one if you look at the times ranking or the qs ranking or the shanghai rankings one of the key questions they ask is how many nobel laureates do you have or how many field medalists do you have or how many Pulitzer Prize winners do you have? In other words, whether it is Harvard or Yale or Columbia or Princeton, they can boast of Nobel laureates in their teaching faculty or in their alumni. But unfortunately in India, we do not have any such claim. One major deficiency with Indian colleges and India, Indian universities. We have two other deficiencies. I will very briefly talk about it. Now, if you go to these universities, British universities or American universities or European universities, I have visited some of these major universities. What you find is, you find a rich student diversity. Okay. In other words, you have a strong international presence. You go to some of the major universities in Europe, you have people from almost all countries and even crossing the Atlantic, you have American students. Okay, whereas in India, we have very, very few foreign students. In fact, most universities do not have any foreign students. So therefore, this is one major deficiency. Then the third major deficiency is, what about the faculty? Once again, we do not have international professors on our roles. Whereas you go to Columbia, you go to Harvard, you go to Yale, or you go to Catholic University at Leuven, Belgium, where I was as an international visiting fellow. Okay, so there are a lot of professors from other countries. So in other words, three major deficiencies. So some of the best institutions in the world, they have Nobel laureates either on their roles or as alumni. They have international student population and international professors. So that is another major issue in higher education, particularly with reference to India. Then the 10th one is resource crunch. Okay. So funds are depleting, so therefore there is a severe resource crunch and there is, and this is another major issue in higher education. Now the 11th major issue in higher education is the question of unemployed and unemployable. What is the meaning of unemployed? Students have degrees, but they are unable to find employment. Now there is another question, in fact, a major question, why is it that students are unemployed? They have degrees, they have BAs, they have BSCs, they have BCOMs. Some of them have even MPhil degrees, some of them have even PhD degrees. So in spite of possessing degrees, why is it that they are unemployed? So therefore we need to talk of not only unemployment, but also unemployability. So which means they have paper degrees, but they do not have the potential for employment. In other words, what the market needs, what the market demands, those qualities, those attributes are unfortunately lacking in these graduate students. So on paper, they are qualified for employment, but skill-wise, temperament-wise, aptitude-wise, they are not qualified for employment. So therefore, higher educational institution should look into this. Then the last point that I want to discuss as far as major issues in higher education is this, information versus knowledge. In fact, I would like to add a third category, information, first category, second category, knowledge, the third category would be wisdom. Anyway, I would like to leave out the third category, information versus knowledge. Now the question is, what is it that students gain in our classrooms, whether it is a college or a university? Is it information or is it knowledge? Now to a large extent, is it, inf it is information. Okay, so what is the difference between information and knowledge? 
I would like to talk of two major differences between information on the one hand and knowledge on the other. Now, what are the two differences? Information is something basic. Knowledge is something higher. Now, when I say information is basic, the knowledge is higher. So therefore, a question arises, what makes knowledge higher and better than information? The answer is very simple. Unprocessed is information, whereas processed is knowledge. In other words, bits and pieces, that is information without any relation. Okay, now when you process them, when you assemble these bits and pieces and when you process them, when you link them, study the causal connections, then it becomes knowledge. Okay, but unfortunately what happens is students are stuck at the level of information. They are unable to process what they gather, what they glean from textbooks and from the lectures of their teachers. They are unable to process them and convert them into knowledge. So dear friends, that marks the end of the last segment. So what I did in the last segment was I talked about, I discussed 12 major issues in higher education. Now I'll take a couple of minutes. I'll give you the summary of my lectures. Now in the first segment, which was titled, What is a University? I talked about the differences between colleges and universities. And I also talked of the objectives of higher education. So that was the major thrust of the first segment or the first unit. In the second segment or in the second unit, I talked about university governance. I talked about the major authorities in universities, state universities and central universities. And I also talked about the various statutory bodies. And towards the end, I talked about the attributes that graduates should possess, whether they pass out of a college or a university. So that was the second segment. In the third segment, I talked about three models of higher education. I talked about two Western models, namely the Humboldtian model, which synthesized the teaching and research, and Cardinal Newman's model, which underlined liberal education as opposed to pragmatic or utilitarian education. And they also talked about the Gandhian model of education. Then in the last segment, I discussed the 12 major issues in higher education. Thank you very much.